Hi guys. Hello. Hello. Hi. Thanks everyone for joining us uh, for the launch of H's book, Henrik Menzi's book. Um, we've got an agenda, so um, quite a, bit, a few speeches to get through, um, and they are uh, they're going to be good. Some you know, good people. Uh, Use the mic. People can't hear you. Can hear you. That's fine. There's a mic. Bridget. Welcome. Thanks. All the dead old buggers. Yeah. <laughs> 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 So our um, first speaker was going to be Paul Ashton. Um, uh, Paul um, has known uh, H uh, well for many years. Um, unfortunately, he's in um, Cornwall at the moment. Uh, his uh, brother's busy dying, so he couldn't be here. Um, he did, however, write a speech um, that's going to be delivered. Um, there are copies floating around, so if you want one, uh, please uh, ask Sasha um, for one. Um, the speech is going to be read by uh, Penny uh, Busetto, um, and she kindly volunteered to do that. Um, Penny has worked uh, and reviewed uh, Paul's books, so she's well uh, positioned to uh, to give give, give the, to deliver the, the speech. She's uh, an award-winning uh, novelist and uh, recently published the story of Anna P. as told by herself. And is studying towards a PhD. Um, so, Penny, if you could um, take to the mic. To say that I'm very honoured to be to, to be reading this paper this evening. Um, I've known for Paul for some years now, and I admire his ideas very much. Um, it, it feels I, I've been very interested also for the last couple of years in in the question of voice, and it feels very fitting for me now to be giving a voice to his words. So it's it's a great privilege this evening. Um, it's called Entering the Void. So I think you're in for quite an evening. Um, my apologies to Henny for not being here personally to give this short input. Although Cornwall is a long way away, my soul is with you tonight. As I thought about Henny's request that I talk about the void, a pet interest of mine from a psychological perspective, I realized that his book and my interest overlap hugely. When I refer to the void, I mean a number of different things that are covered in his deep and yet accessible book. Many of us live in a state of disconnection from our whole selves. This has been referred to as loss of self, and it is at one level the main thrust of Enter, uh, um, Henny's book. The question arises, how can we get to know those parts that have been denied or neglected and are thus unknown to us, those parts of ourselves that are unknown to us? when we are not conscious of them. That state of unconsciousness can be referred to as living in the void, as we are void or empty of our whole selves. Often we are reasonably comfortable with that state. We shut out from our awareness parts of ourselves that we do not like. And it is only those who know us intimately who are conscious of our lack of authenticity and to irritatingly remind us of that lack. As we begin working on increasing our awareness of what has previously been unconscious, we enter what the mystic St. John of the Cross referred to as the dark night of the soul. This is another void experience brought about by becoming conscious of what we initially judge as negative aspects of our personality. With horror, we realize that this too is me, and we do not want to know that. It disturbs our smug sense of being what Henny calls us. Despite all the deodorants in the world, we begin to stink to ourselves. <clears throat> Luckily, matters do not rest there. With delight, we may come to know, sometimes for the first time, 
but often as a recollection about positive aspects of ourselves, our creativity perhaps, our playfulness, or our ability to deeply love. We also realize that being authentic does not imply a necessary acting out of our negative aspects. We may use our anger, for example, normally thought of as negative, as a sort of energy, source of energy, in the service of self-assertion, standing up for what we believe. And in fact, just being conscious of our capacity for rage makes it less likely that the rage will unexpectedly surface and damage someone we love. As we take on, in other words, become, pers but become aware of previously unknown aspects of ourselves, both negative and positive, because they are positives too, our personality and that sense of who I am expands and feels more solid, more certain. We are able to differentiate received criticism, for example, as sometimes being at least partly a projection from the criticizer rather than always being true to our, of ourselves. And that ability to differentiate what is ours from what is theirs leads to an increased se sense of solidity. As one of my clients put it, I used to feel like one of those silhouettes on a toilet door. Now I feel three-dimensional. <clears throat> the entering required to do this honestly implies working hard, being honest, being courageous, and not falling asleep on the job. And I think that that's really the fundamental point of this whole thing, is being courageous, being honest, and working. Not falling asleep on the job, except to dream, which as Henny suggests requires yet more work. Those four qualities, being awake, working hard, and being honest and courageous with oneself, were defined by the alchemists of old as being necessary for the work, the work of alchemy. That work was imagined as attempting to turn a base metal such as lead into gold. But C.G. Jung understood the alchemists' endeavors as symbolic of the sort of work that Henny has been engaged in, becoming conscious of his true self. And I would say that in his book, he has demonstrated, probably unknowingly, how he has used those qualities. But back to the void. In the first manifestation of the void, <coughs> described above, the image could be one of deadness, something missing. And this is often visible or intuited by those around one. As a subject, one may be darkly unaware, except for a vague unease <coughs> or not me or not me outbursts, that there's anything amiss, anything lacking. That's the first stage of, of, of moving into the void. In the next manifestation, the images are falling into darkness. In some of his late poems, D. H. Lawrence describes this as falling from the hands of the living God. And it is into oblivion. In other language, we could call that falling from the known to the unknown. And, sorry. In other language, we could call that falling from the known, call that falling from the known to the unknown, and black is its colour. He's talking about this process of psychic shifting, so moving from a place of deadness to a sense of falling. This is talking about psyche. We start by thinking that we know who we are, but what we know is only the surface, and there is much more to us than just that. As we plumb the depths, we initially feel frightened. Who is this person, we may ask? It feels as though we have been taken over by some unpleasant demon, and we wish we could go back to who we were. But then, we start to feel alive. Henny describes this shift well. As what has been discovered about oneself, good and bad, comes to be known and accepted, and one realizes that one still has a choice about how to behave. One's personality seems to expand, not that one becomes inflated, although there is, that is a risk, but there's simply more of one. The sense of the black void, the emptiness and meaninglessness, the interminable falling, the oblivion, oblivion all disappear, and life pulses through one. It is at this point that what could be called the white void may supervene. This is the space in which paradox dances, the space celebra celebrated by Niels Bohr in the quotation Henny referenced in Note 65. I don't know what that is. Oh, how wonderful that we have met with a paradox. Now we have some hope of making progress. <laughs> Suddenly one knows about inclusivity. Both this and that, even if contradictory, may be true. I can have malevolent thoughts, but act benevolently. 
I can be beautiful and ugly at the same time. I'm not diminished by anything about myself. And most importantly, I'm comfortable with mystery. It strikes me that when the clouds of unknowing, described as such by the English mystic who wrote about 500 AD, are pierced by the white light of acceptance, remember that white light is a blend of all the colors of the rainbow, whereas darkness presupposes an absence of light. You have experienced God, or what we call the God image within, that which Jungians term the self, God as wholeness, as everything. That is what the alchemist called the work. Dante saw, sorry, that, and that is what alchemists called the work. Dante saw as the end of purgatory and the beginning of paradiso, and the English mystic referred to as the movement from being singular, one's own self, to being perfect. This last idea of perfection suggests a pinnacle of purity, which is clearly impossible to reach authentically. In Jungian thought, the work is towards embracing all aspects of oneself, to become whole rather than perfect. Penny's book describes that process. Thank you.